Good morning and welcome to our discussion about the cost of renting crisis and the role that subsidies uh, play in housing affordability. Um, just two quick housekeeping notes. Uh, first, I have to let you know that this session is being recorded. Uh, second, we will be taking questions at the end, so please do send them in via the chat function as we go along. Uh, so my name is Melissa Lawford. I'm economics reporter at The Telegraph. Um, I'm joined here by Rachel Erica, senior economist at the Joseph Roundtree Foundation, and Ian Mulhern, independent economist and one of the authors of the excellent report on the evolution of housing affordability since 1979, which we are going to discuss. Um, now, I think we can all agree that the rental market has become absolutely insane um, in the last two years. It really, really has become a wild west. Um, nationally, rents rose by 12% last year, according to Zoopla, that's rents on new lets. Uh, and that was a jump at twice the rate of earnings growth. Uh, in London, the increase was 17%. And at the same time, tenants are battling with the largest drop in real disposable income since the 1950s. There's a big looming risk of a very, very substantial increase in rent arrears. Um, but often I find the question isn't even about price, but it's about whether or not you can actually physically find somewhere to live. Uh, across the country, Zoopla data shows demand is 46% higher than the five-year average, while supply is 38% lower. Uh, letting agents are always talking about people queuing for viewings, bidding over asking price, and submitting letters and CVs just to try and set themselves apart. Um, at the same time, and this may sound really mad, but the buy to let business model is breaking down. Landlords with large portfolios who own and company structures can still make the sums add up, but for landlords who own one or two properties in their own name with mortgages are struggling. For many of these landlords, even sky high rents are not enough to sufficiently offset the new burdens of high interest rates and high taxes, and that means a lot of them are selling up. Uh, Private landlords issued nearly 26,000 possession claims in England and Wales in 2022. Um, that's more than in any other year on record since at least 1999. Those people getting evicted face little chance of finding a new rental property, and there's an extreme shortage of social housing, which means they also have little chance of getting anywhere else to live either. Um, up until recently, I was working as property correspondent and I spent a lot of time talking to landlords and I had so many stories of situations where a landlord was trying to sell and they had served an eviction notice, but because the council couldn't house the tenant, they instructed the tenant to stay in the property beyond their notice period until they had been removed by a bailiff, which because of the delays in the court system could take six months or a year. And actually that, that protection, if you can call it a protection, is, is almost becoming a pillar of this country's social housing policy. Um, there's a really enormous human toll from this broken system. There's also a really big insidious economic burden. Um, something I'm personally very interested in is how Britain's problems with housing, and some of these issues really are unique to us, uh, is tied to the similarly unique problems that we have with productivity and growth. We have some of the worst commuting times in the OECD. And, and when people have to spend very high proportions of their salaries on their housing costs, that's money that is not going into the economy in more productive ways, um, which is one of the many reasons why the total dearth of housing policies in the spring budget felt like a huge missed opportunity for the Chancellor. Um, but perhaps now, Ian, you could talk us through the findings of, of your report and show us how the last 35 years or so of policymaking has got us to where we are today. Thanks, Melissa, and morning, everybody. And uh, Melissa, as you say, I think that the, the, the issues that 
that attend the housing market are sort of many and varied and there's lots of different parts to them but what, what I'm going to do in the um, few minutes I have is talk about a report that uh, we did uh, and published with JRF in January which looks just at the rental affordability side of the, the issue um, so if we could move to the next slide um, I'll take you through uh, our findings. And let's go on one more. Great. So, um, so our report was called Housing Affordability Since 1979, Determinants and Solutions. So we, as the name suggests, taking a very long term um, perspective on what's happened to uh, uh, the affordability of housing for renters of different uh, types uh, over the past generation and a bit because there's been a huge amount of, of, of change. Uh, and the aim of the research was really to quantify how the value of different forms of support that uh, tenants receive, uh, housing subsidies as we've kind of grouped them together and called them, how that has changed since that uh, 1979, since 1979. And, and to try and discover the extent to which that explains many of the problems that we're seeing today, at least with the affordability side of, of what's going on in housing. Uh, and this report was commissioned, as I say, by JRF, and it was also by me uh, with co-authors James Brown and Christos Soulaktis from the Tony Blair Institute. Uh, and then the report also looks at, I won't go into this today, but we also look at what the optimal mix of different forms of housing subsidies might be if we wanted to sort of rebuild a housing affordability, particularly for people who are struggling the most. I won't go into that in detail, but please do take a look at the report, and there's some really good stuff on that. Uh, uh, to in the discussion as well. So let's go to the next slide. <clears throat> um, this chart here on the right shows uh, actual rents as a as a proportion of household income since 1979. It's quite it'd be familiar to many of you who, who are familiar with uh, housing policy issues, and really shows a quite staggering rise in the chunk of uh, people's wages essentially that that uh, rents are taking up a very big uh, acceleration over the 80s and early 90s, and then a sort of steady sort of drift up uh, subsequently to reach around 25% of households' incomes. Um, depending on how we calculate these things, you can get different figures, but the pattern is always the same with this very uh, significant increase. And that really, in, in a nutshell, captures the affordability uh, problem. Now, there's a lot, in response to kind of charts like this, there's a lot of focus on the cost of market rents and whether housing supply is adequate uh, and, and all those kind of things. Um, but we also need to focus on what's been happening to social housing, to rent regulations and to housing benefits, which all have a massive influence on this picture and, uh, and how affordable housing is for people. So that was really the focus of this piece. So if we go to the next slide, we'll go through each of these three forms of support, these housing subsidies in turn. The first very familiar story is the erosion of housing and social housing support over the years. Uh, now, obviously, social housing provides benefits to tenants in the form of secure tenure. Um, but it's also from an economics perspective, it's also uh, provides a subsidy to tenants because it provides rents at a lower level than you would get for an equivalent property uh, in the private rented sector. Um, but the scale of that effective subsidy and the generosity of, of, uh, has been scaled back, as well as the size of the social rented sector stock uh, in the wake of the right to buy policies in the 80s and lots of selling off of social housing. That stock has shrunk from a th almost a third of the housing stock of England to about 17 percent uh, in recent years. Uh, but also that subsidy has been eroded as social rents have increased. Now, if you look at the, the chart there in 1979, you can see the actual social rented sector uh, uh, rents uh, round about uh, 40 pounds a week. And the uh, but the market rents for an equivalent house would have been somewhere around 75 pounds a week. So that subsidy is effectively the green bar or the green block on top. And it was around, it was coming on for almost half of um, uh, the value of the market rents of, of a given house, the value of that subsidy. But that's been eroded. And in, 19, in 2019, there on the right, you can see uh, it's it's a very much uh, smaller proportion of the market value that you're getting in, in effective subsidies through social housing. So for two reasons, that, that, so, that social housing support uh, has, has, has reduced over the years. So let's go on to the second driver. <clears throat> 
So the second driver is um, one we don't really think about anymore because it's almost ancient history now, really. Um, and that's the the support that was provided to tenants through rent regulations. Now, uh, in the sort of post-war era, we we until 1979 largely had this system of fair rents, um, which was uh, holding uh, regulations that held the um, level of market sector, private sector rents below what their free market level would be. Uh, and, and you can see that that, um, it, again, we've got here the sort of regulated rent level is the blue bar in, this, in these charts across the regions. And the green bit is the effective subsidy that's provided by holding those rents below their free market level. And effectively, this is a subsidy to tenants from landlords. It's 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 preventing landlords from from getting the what would be the normal market return on on housing, and instead um, uh, uh, cutting rents for for tenants. So a big transfer that effectively it involves to to tenants. Uh, now that was removed in uh, gradually through the eighties, and then finally in nineteen eighty nine with the with the assured shorthold tenancy, uh, which eventually effectively meant that very quickly. Uh, rents in the private sector converged on their free market level and jumped uh, quite substantially. You can see uh, in that total bar on the right just how much of uh, a subsidy to private rents that those regulations provided. And then how you can imagine just how that would drive up that cost of housing as it's sort of suddenly removed. So that's the second uh, form of subsidy that has been eroded. And the third one is obviously housing benefits. Um, uh, now, in the, in the wake of these sort of the erosion of social housing and the, and the removal of uh, rent regulations, um, we saw housing benefit effectively surge through the 80s and 90s. Um, and, you know, you can also see a, a bump around the 2008 financial crisis, it went up again. Um, but that was really uh, largely housing benefits picking up the slack from the, the reduction in these other forms of subsidies. But then since 2010, uh, successive governments have tried to cut different elements of housing benefit entitlement and to, and to reduce the bill. Um, Modelling that is not entirely straightforward because of the introduction of universal credit. But um, when, when we did so, we found that they cut the bill by around five billion compared to what it would have been uh, in, by 2019 had policies remained unchanged. And the ongoing local housing allowance freeze is continuing to cut that expenditure. Uh, so in this third form of subsidy, the one perhaps we're most familiar with almost, it, it's, it's risen substantially, largely because of the cuts to other forms of subsidy. And that, uh, but now is being, now is being cut back. Uh, so the, the story is a more recent reduction in the support that's provided uh, through this channel. So if we go to the next uh, slide, um, we can combine these and think about what what that's done to the total value of support that, that households receive. Now, one thing to note is that the pounds, the real terms, uh, uh, pounds value of uh, housing subsidies, if you total all these three forms of subsidy together, has actually been fairly stable over the years. Uh, but that's not despite all these cuts. But of course, housing costs go up. They tend to track wages. Uh, they, you'd expect them to rise with as the economy grows. And therefore, it's better to think of the value of housing subsidy as a proportion of the total housing costs of the country uh, and so to get a sense of how generous that level of support is. And that's what we've done in this chart here. So you can see that back in 1979, the three forms of subsidy together were kind of providing a subsidy that was worth sort of 17, 18% of, um, of total housing costs in England each year, um, at 16.5% right in 1979, but sort of bounces around a bit. Um, and, and by 2019, that's fallen to 11%. And you can see that the private sector rent controls bit has totally disappeared. The social housing has sort of shrunk significantly and housing benefits come up a fair bit. Uh, and, and to put that in pounds and pence terms, that's effectively means that the subsidy that was being provided, if policy had remained as it was in 1979, would have been around 45 billion in 2019. Uh, but it was, in fact, around 31 billion that year. So it cut by around a third. So if we go into the next uh, slide. We can also take a quick look at how this support has been um, distributed. And this is this is really quite, quite interesting. Um, 
so a very big cut in support, but who's been hit hardest? Well, actually, the largest absolute reductions in the level of subsidy have been felt by people in the middle, renters in the middle and upper parts of the income distribution. And that's mostly because, uh, you know, uh, uh, the housing subsidies that were being provided through social housing and rent controls in 1979 were fairly, uh, uh, fairly blind to the income of the, of the tenant. Uh, which meant that there were some uh, reasonably well-off households who are benefiting from those sub-market rents and social housing. And that the changes that we've seen since 1979 have, have radically changed that. Um, uh, so that's meant that the biggest sort of quantum of cuts has come for people higher up the income distribution. In the right-hand panel there, you can sort of see that support level dropping away as income rises. Um, uh, but it, and more, there's been a bit more protection on the left hand side and among the poorest um, who are now seeing most of their support coming through uh, housing benefit in that light blue line. Um, but while the cuts have been mostly focused on the top end, we shouldn't underestimate just how stark those cuts in support are for people at the bottom. If you take the second uh, decile there, you can see that people are getting support to the tune of around 85 percent of market housing costs in uh, 1979, and that is now down to about 70%, which is effectively a doubling of the housing costs those kind of families are facing today. Uh, and if you were to try and restore that affordability to the bottom half of the income distribution that we had in 1979, that would cost around 7 billion a year, we estimate. Okay, so if we just go on to the next slide, um, and we can sort of think about what's the overall impact of, of that removal of rent controls uh, and uh, and the other forms of subsidy over the years. And one of the most interesting charts here is the panel, panel A, the private rented sector chart. Now, what we essentially see in that very first chart I showed you is effectively the, the kind of green line uh, that rises up until the early 90s and then hits the blue line and drifts up. So you see that rise in, in costs as a proportion of, uh, uh, of household incomes. But what, what this chart shows you is that when you strip out the effect of those subsidies, the blue line is relatively flat throughout. In other words, the market cost of rented housing has been relatively stable across this entire period. And it's really just that erosion of subsidies, which has seen households being uh, facing more of those costs themselves. And, and the purple line there is net of housing benefits. So if you take off um, the value of support people are getting in housing benefit, that lowers the, uh, the, the costs. Um, uh, and so you, you can see that the underlying cost of housing hasn't actually changed very much. It's really just a question of who pays for it. And that shifted from a mixture of tenants, landlords and government to really being mostly tenants with a bit of government. Um, and what that means is that the reduction in housing subsidies largely explains the trend we've seen, certainly in the private rented sector, of declining affordability over the past 45 years. One thing just to say on the social rented sector is obviously uh, you see rents rising as a pro proportion of household incomes. That's partly for the reasons I've described, but it's also partly because the average incomes of people in the social rented sector have fallen significantly as better off tenants have left the sector, which sort of plays havoc with this chart and slightly explains why the picture looks the way it does. So just to conclude, then, if we go to the next uh, slide, um, uh, Housing affordability for renters over the past 45 years is, is, to a huge extent, is a story about changes in these subsidies that are available to, to tenants and those three big forms of subsidy that, that we've discussed here. And what that tells us is that if we really talk, if we really want to talk about how to make housing more affordable, uh, then there isn't really a route that doesn't go through strengthening housing subsidies. When you listen to the housing debate today, you would think there was one set of policies that was going to solve everything. Uh, and really, when you're talking about um, housing affordability, what this shows is that there's no way around some form of subsidies if you want to improve affordability. Uh, and supply is mu a much weaker way to achieve that than uh, many of these uh, levers have been in the past. Um, uh, and that's not to say we want to recreate the 1979 system. There were lots of problems with it. It was pretty unsustainable. 
And certainly, I think us as the authors would probably say that controls on rent levels are, 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 are probably to be avoided and probably unsustainable. But there are many other levers we have, and we look in the report at how you might use housing benefit, relinking the local housing allowance to housing costs, uh, together with uh, an expanded social housing sector to, to do most of that heavy lifting in terms of improving, uh, improving affordability. Um, and then it, what we go into the report finally is just to th think about, well, how would you decide what the right mix is between social housing and housing benefits? And a lot of that, a lot of the answer to that really depends on the demographics of the population uh, that you've got, you know, families with kids, many of them now are in the private rental sector in a very unstable accommodation, and really that needs to change. Uh, but it also depends on how far we want to make the tenure of the, in the private rental sector more secure. And there, the government's planned reforms to the private rental sector will be interesting to see how far they go, uh, because that may tackle some of these, these challenges. Uh, but do encourage you to read the report, and uh, I'll leave it there. Uh, thank you so much, Ian. Uh, lots of things to to unpack there. But um, first of all, Rachel, would you like to put that into the context of the wider cost of living crisis today? Yeah, perfect. Thanks so much, Melissa. And um, thanks, Ian. The um, yeah, so I think uh, so what Ian, uh, the, the period of time that Ian sort of covered went up to sort of 2019, 20. So I'm sort of going to cover from from there on in terms of how private renters are faring at the moment. Um, and if we move on to the next slide, I'll start with some data that was released last Thursday, um, which shows us the um, the poverty rates um, across the UK uh, in uh, 2021, 2022. Um, so just to draw your attention to the um, sort of darkish bluish line and um, the second one from the top there, um, looking at private renters. Um, so we've seen an increase in the proportion of private renters who are in after housing cost relative poverty. Um, it's increased uh, from the last few years where it was sort of 33, 32 percent um, up to 35 percent again. Um, and I think the reason that I want to sort of draw attention to this and the reason that that is so concerning um, is that during that year that we're looking at there, there was the £20 uplift uh, to universal credit. Um, rents uh, were, were closer, uh, sorry, LHA had been increased back in sort of April 2020. So rents were closer to being, um, you, you know, linked to, to LHA rates there. Um, and we hadn't yet seen the massive spike in rents that we have been seeing um, sort of over the last year or so um, across the country. So really concerning that the proportion of private renters who are in after, after housing cost poverty there has grown, um, all while there was still, you know, quite a good amount of support in place. Um, moving on to the next slide. Uh, JRF has been tracking the impact of the cost of living crisis on lower income households um, over the last sort of year and a half. Um, and what we found in our last wave of this, which was carried out in October, November last year, is just how much high housing costs have a, have a lot to answer for during the cost of living crisis. So um, we've been looking at how low income households have been potentially going without essentials, um, and when we break that down by tenure, what we see is that between May and October last year, the proportion of private renters who reported going without essentials, so that is either experiencing food insecurity, being unable to keep their home warm, may potentially um, uh, unable to afford adequate clothing for the weather, unable to afford sort of like basic uh, things like toiletries or unable to afford essential journeys for their household. Um, the proportion of private renters on a low income um, has increased from 75% to 85% of those going without essentials, which is a massive jump over a six month period, much higher than, than other 10 years, but also, you know, really shocking that over eight in 10 low income private renters have reported going without essentials last year. Um, what we also found was that two thirds of private renters um, were in arrears with at least one household bill. Around a fifth were in rent arrears, um, and that had increased from May. Um, 
and I think this sort of goes back to what Melissa was saying about what the human toll is as well of higher rents. So the really key thing that we saw last year was that, um, yes, mortgage interest rates had definitely gone up sort of between um, May and October, November, um, but it was mainly private rents that had, that had gone up significantly. Private renters are more likely to be living in energy and efficient homes. Um, you know, so when energy bills are going up and rents are really skyrocketing, that is having massive impact um, on your ability to just afford the basics. Um, what we also found, and this is unsurprising, but really, really stark, was that almost every household in the private rented sector who was behind on their rent was also going without essentials um, and experiencing food insecurity. So it's not sort of either, either, you know, going without heating, going without food, unable to pay your rent. It's going without sort of everything all at once, which has a massive toll on your health uh, and well-being and your financial position as well. Um, really sort of concerning was that around 50% of low-income private renters said that they had used lending um, or a credit card just to pay for their essential bills like rent or energy or council tax. Um, and around two thirds had taken out a high cost credit loan. And of those who had taken out a high cost credit loan, around half were in arrears. So really sort of stark findings there um, on the, the impact of high housing costs. If we go on to the next slide, um, just want to also touch on, I guess, the security of tenure uh, for those um, in both the social sector, but also the private rented sector more specifically. So what we found was that when we asked um, lower income private renters um, around whether or not they'd received a formal eviction notice, being told to leave or threatened to leave their property, or whether or not their rent increase that they um, had had, um, they wouldn't be able to afford it. Um, we found that almost a quarter of all low-income private renters were actually at risk of eviction sort of ahead of the winter. Um, so we'll be sort of monitoring that closely um, and recapturing sort of what is happening there um, over the coming months. But that is really, really worrying as rents continue to rise, um, but also because we know that asking rents are really, really high in certain areas at the moment. Uh, and if we go on to the next slide... Um, we can see that those on housing benefit and on universal credit um, are facing particularly high levels of hardship if they're living in the private rented sector. So um, uh, almost nine and 10 going without essentials in the second half of last year, 76%, um, so more than three quarters, were experiencing food insecurity, 71% in arrears with at least one household bill. Before the winter, um, almost four in 10 were unable to afford to heat their home adequately. Um, and a third had used credit or loans to pay for their essential bills. Um, and 28% faced the risk of eviction. So really sort of scary levels of that, that human toll and the health and well-being impacts um, of how high rents um, and an inadequate social security system um, to support low-income renters as, as having an impact there on going without essentials. And then if we go on to the last slide, um, so just to touch on this, so um, we, um, so uh, Rightmove um, published um, some really useful data uh, looking at what the average sort of asking rents are um, in England, excluding London here. Um, since uh, September 2019. So, um, and that point is particularly significant because that is the rent level that the current local housing allowance is set at. So, since September 2019, um, we have seen a 25% increase in average asking rents across England, excluding London. If you include London, it's around 20%. Um, and as you can see on that green line there, the local housing allowance rate has been frozen uh, since since then. So that has definitely not increased to keep pace with things um, and is definitely a big reason behind why we're seeing so many low income um, private renters really sort of struggling to make ends meet. Of course, you know, increasing it back up to the 30th percentile would make a, like a really big impact um, on household budgets when we know that so many are currently in negative budgets. Um, but in general as well, the rest of our social security system also needs to keep up too. We go to the next slide. Um, 
So just to touch on our recommendations there and to sort of pack back to why we need to look at both housing benefit, but also other changes uh, to our social security system. At JRF, we're calling for an essentials guarantee. So for the government to be making changes to universal credit so that that basic rate of support, even after deductions, um, can never be so low that people are unable to afford essentials like food, energy bills, um, and basic household go goods. It's fairly unacceptable, in fact, very, very unacceptable that at the moment we've got almost nine in 10 um, households on universal credit, but also private renters um, who are going without essentials. Um, our social security system should be adequate enough uh, that you should never have to worry about going without those basics. And it's just not keeping up at the moment. A big part of that is also, of course, because local housing allowance has been frozen, while those rents have really been skyrocketing across the country. Um, and so, of course, that needs to be unfrozen and reinstated to at a minimum cover that bottom 30th percentile of rents. Um, as Ian touched on, uh, we also need to drastically expand our social housing supply uh, across the UK. Um, the private rented sector is not designed and even with strengthening to it to improve the security of tenure, it is simply not the right place for many kinds of households um, to be if you're on a very low income, um, if you've got often disabled uh, family members, um, if you are retired, if you're a household with children, often the private rented sector is just not going to be a suitable tenure for you. So we drastically need to improve the amount of social housing that we've got in the country. Um, and as we noted as well, the budget um, the week before last just completely ignored the fact that we are entering a housing market downturn um, and we are in a renting crisis. So we need to address the impacts of that, both for private renters, but also for um, sort of vulnerable low income mortgage holders as well. Um, and I will pass back. Thank you so much, Rachel. Um, this, this, this perhaps is a, a question for, for both of you. Um, and I'd like to ask a couple of questions before I uh, open up uh, to, to the floor. Um, that figure in, in the report uh, is really striking. Um, if housing subsidies had remained at the 1979 levels as a share of total housing costs, they would have been worth 45 billion uh, in 2019-2020, and instead they're worth 31 billion. Um, on the surface, that sounds like the Treasury is making a saving. And I, I think some people would look at those numbers and think, we have enormous government debt and, and very high debt servicing costs, and, and the Chancellor has got to cut back somewhere. Um, Rachel, maybe you could answer this first. I mean, what would be your response to that? Because my instinct is that this apparent saving actually is, is likely to be driving up costs for the Treasury in indirect ways when, when they have to step in and, and help all of those people who are having you know, the, these enormous problems as a result. What, what are your thoughts on, on the kind of fiscal policy side of that? Yeah, so... So I guess on that it is who is bearing that shortfall in cost uh, at the moment. Uh, if it's not the government, it is those who are renting. Um, and so I guess we're seeing the impact of that now in terms of many renters having to go without the basics, but also not having much say in the kind of accommodation that they can access. So really poor quality um, accommodation in many instances, looking at overcrowding um, and, and unable to also access home ownership themselves. So I think there, there's, a, there's a sort of a big flow on effect in terms of both very low income households facing massive hardship. People can't get on the housing ladder because they're paying so much money um, in rent themselves. Um, and you're and, and you're having to make massive trade-offs on the on the kinds of homes that, that you can access and also where you can live. Um, so that is definitely being burdened there, but it's also being burdened in, in other areas like our health system. Um, and that those costs, those costs add up as well. Um, and that's also where we're seeing massive increases in um, the need for temporary accommodation and homelessness um, and, rough, and rough sleeping. These are figures that are going up all the time at the moment. And it's just not surprising when we're not investing in areas like housing benefit, but also in building more social homes as well. And if we were building more social homes, actually that bill looks a little bit different too. Thank you. 
Uh, Ian, is, is there anything you'd like to add to that? Yeah, I think it, it is an interesting chart, that one. And I think it's it's also a bit confusing because it, it really uh, captures the value of support that's going to tenants, not necessarily the cost to government. So, for example, in 1979, a significant chunk of that support to tenants was coming from landlords, not from government itself. Um, and then in terms of the social housing support, um, you know, in a, in a sort of static sense, social housing is a bit of a free lunch in the sense that um, government can you know, borrow much more cheaply than uh, than uh, private actors can, and therefore its cost of finance is lower. And by subsidising tenants with below market rents, it's able to kind of cover the cost of its the debt required to build social housing through uh, lower rents. Um, so, in some ways, you know, having having reduced the the amount of social housing, the uh, or if it, if it were to increase it again, it wouldn't actually necessarily cost the Treasury directly uh, in, 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 uh, in the sense that it could cover the cost of that debt with, with the rents from, from tenants. So the Housing Benefit Bill has actually increased costs to government in the, um, uh, in, the, in the short run. So you've got this weird situation where co direct costs to the Exchequer have increased, and yet the level of support to households has decreased and it's sort of like how can how can these two things uh, be the case and, uh, and and so it's a bit of a complicated um complicated picture i mean that's not to say that social housing is the only answer and it's always uh, uh the, the optimal thing to do partly because you know uh, there's a premium on having a flexible labor market and people able to move around the country and all that sort of thing so you wouldn't necessarily want to have uh, you know take this argument to an extreme but it's certainly the case that um uh, it's it's uh, for, for for many households, it's the cheapest form of subsidy that government can provide. Um, we've had uh, one one question about right to buy, and and this was something you mentioned earlier, Ian, and and was a question that I wanted to ask. Um, I think I think the question we had was um, how many social housing properties were, were sold off through right to buy, and I think that figure was about. 2 million, which is also about the figure um, of people, the, there were about 2 million private renters who are on housing benefits. Um, obviously, some of the right to buy properties got replaced, but but a very small proportion of them did, or, or a very inadequate proportion of them did. And, and it just strikes me that there's been this sea change over the years in, in government housing policy where we used to have a model uh, whereby if you couldn't afford to live somewhere uh, the government would provide social housing and you'd pay rent to to the local authority and, and they would provide you with a home and then there's been this shift where those those properties have been sold off and instead the government pays subsidies uh, to tenants in the private rental market so it, I, I mean I guess it's a kind of privatization of of social housing uh, into the private rental sector. Um, I mean, I, I'm interested. Is is Ian? Is is that how you see it, or or if I? Yeah, I I think you summarised it very well, Melissa. I think that's exactly what's happened. So instead of government paying for its own sort of cost of capital through having a large stock of social housing, it's now paying for private landlords to essentially. Uh, 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 sort of finance properties in the private rental sector. That it's it's not that's not all bad in the sense that it um, it does al allow for a much more flexible labour market. It allows people to have more choice. Allows people to move around. Uh, and in principle, if you regulated the private rental sector better, you could make sure that the quality was at least as high uh, as anything that could be provided by government. So it's not necessarily entirely bad, but we should recognise that it is quite costly. And so you have to hope that the additional flexibilities and productivity benefits that might flow from that system are good enough to warrant spending more money on housing benefit and less on on social housing. But I think you're basically right to say, you know, there's a pretty much well, it's not quite true that there's a one for one switch from people out of social housing into the private rent sector and, and on to um, uh, and on to housing benefits as a result, because as that distributional chart uh, I put up showed, there's quite a lot of relatively higher income households who in the past would have been in social housing and would have benefited from rent regulations who 
in nowadays we would say they don't really need that so those forms of subsidy weren't necessarily brilliantly targeted either um but the broad picture you paint is i think the right one yeah um and when one of the policies or, or one of the recommendations of the report um and I, i'd like to go through each of them but but let's start on social house building um you think the the gap is about 700,000 social housing properties that that need to be built to to improve all of this um Rachel, the the government's had a lot of problems um building social housing uh, over the last well, a few decades um in your in your view what, what are the way what are the things that they could do to sort of unlock social house building you to to make it easier for local authorities to build these properties and kind of get that going again because the numbers are are incredibly low at the moment yeah definitely um i think i think this also comes into where there could be a real opportunity at the moment with the kind of housing market downturn that 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 we're about to see. Um, so sort of sort of a real risk at, at the moment um, that we're seeing is, is that, you know, transactions are falling, um, at, you know, starts on sites uh, are falling and sort of stagnating as well. But we're actually not yet seeing like that impact on house prices falling as well. So we're in quite an interesting sort of position at the moment um, in the in the house building and the housing market sector and with house prices. This is a really real big opportunity, actually, for the government to say, we can make sure that the construction sector um, and, and developers can keep going and, and make sure that social housing is a really, really core cool part of that. Um, we know that we actually do need to increase grant funding in order for more social homes to be built. We do need to look at ways in which our planning reform can be changed to, to, better, it, to better encourage that and incentivize it. At the moment, the settings are just not right um, to be able to enable that. But we also just need that political will of a lot more social housing to be built so that people do have that foundation of a good and stable home when the private rental sector just isn't adequate for them. Um, so I think a big part of that is the political will, but it's also seeing, I think, yeah, this kind of the market at the moment as a real opportunity to, to harness that um, and work towards actually changing our distribution um, of tenure across the UK. It's uh, nice to hear some optimism. <laughs> uh, no, I, I, think, I think you make a, a very valid point. Um, it is an opportunity, especially as we have the end of Help to Buy and a lot of forecasts for house building overall to fall in, in the, over the next year or two. Um, I, I, one of the other recommendations and both of you have talked about this is about um bringing uh local housing allowance back in line with current rents and um, one of the questions uh from from our audience um and I, I think this is raises a very interesting point um because i'm very interested in the intersection between uh housing benefits and the wider rental sector because uh those private rental sector tenants who are on uh, who are on housing benefits make up about a third of the private rental sector so that they do have this big influence in in pricing across the wider rental sector and, and so one question here um maybe Ian you could answer this uh, will increasing housing benefit levels uh push up rents I mean is that a risk yeah so I think we um Theoretically, you would expect not. You'd expect kind of uh, uh, landlords to be able to price at, uh, at, 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 at their sort of price takers, really. They can set rents um, according to what the market tells them they can set at. And, and what that tends to mean is that the um, uh, tenants, if they get subsidies or if they have their subsidies cut, tend to bear the brunt of that or take the benefit of it. And so when in the early 2010s we saw significant cuts to housing benefit, there's a good paper from the IFS, which my co-author, James Brown, was a co-author of, uh, which shows that when those cuts were implemented, 90% of the reduction in the benefit uh, was um, uh, was absorbed by the household and rents didn't change. And you might remember back then, there was a lot of stories from the government at the time saying if we cut housing benefits, rents will fall. And they didn't fall. They stayed just as high, and the people who took the squeeze were were the households themselves. So, uh, so I think you know that experience, both 
empirically, but also theoretically, we wouldn't, we wouldn't really expect to see a significant change in rents if you did increase generosity, mainly as households that, that bear the brunt. Um, another another question from the audience, and there's been quite a lot of discussion coming in about rent controls. Um, I mean, Ian, you you, you touched on this um, in your presentation and in the report, talking about how rent controls can have some unintended consequences, and the the they can be a complicated policy. Um, you know, quite quite a few people are asking. Um, do you think private rented sector rent controls should be reintroduced? Um, I think it's worth noting that there's currently temporary rent controls up in Scotland, and it's certainly things that the Scottish government and the Welsh government are, are in a lot of discussions about. And um, London Mayor Sadiq Khan certainly said he would he would like to. He doesn't doesn't have the power to introduce them in London, but you know that this is the policy that is I think quite often discussed as a bit of a silver bullet for problems in the rental sector. Um, uh, Rachel, could could you maybe talk me through your your views on how effective rent controls are as a lever, and and maybe what their their limitations can can be? Yeah, of course. So I th I think we're looking at private rent controls at the moment. Uh, I it it depends on the so I, so I don't necessarily think like widespread rent controls across the UK are currently the answer. I think it depends on the specific markets um, that, that, that you're in. I do think that the longer this particular renting crisis goes on for, um, and the more that it is not being answered by government, the more we actually may need to look at, at solutions like this. Um, I do think that they, that um, sort of private rent controls aren't necessarily the best like long-term solution um, to an issue. Um, but I do think, for example, at the moment, um, and like in, in London and other areas where rents are just soaring beyond the affordability of not just low-income households budgets, but actually that that is rising up the income distribution pretty significantly. You know, when when current sitting tenants are being asked to pay 25% extra on what they're, they're currently paying while there is an energy crisis going on and while other costs are, are rising at almost sort of the same rate. Um, then actually there, there, there is a bigger case for this to be made. Um, yeah, my, my personal view is that it's not a long-term solution. And it, it, if it was in, in the short term, then you would need to um, have things in place in order for how you would sort of extricate out of that. But I actually think that through the Renters Reform Bill and through other mechanisms, mechanisms such as sort of restricting in tenancy rent increases um, and having limits on what landlords can charge at different points um, that also might relate to sort of their costs and other sort of market conditions um, relate well to that. Um, I think it's unfortunately too early to see the impact of what's happened um, up in Scotland. It'll be really interesting to see um, what, what is happening there. Um, but from other data that we've seen in terms of like some of those impacts of rent controls, um, we also have seen that like the risk of eviction and, and things is a little bit lower in those areas than it is um, in the rest of the UK at the moment, which helps to sort of build that case for where you've got that secure foundation of home. Um, we've got one. Oh, sorry, Ian, did you want to? Come so, in? so I was just going to come in on that, Melissa. I mean, I think for for, for my um, for my money, there are some significant risks with sort of blanket rent controls, as as Rachel was sort of saying. And some of them are, if you go back to the late seventies, uh, the early eighties, you, know, you have problems with the availability of uh, private rented housing. You know, you just can't. Get, you know, we sort of underestimate that now because you can easily get. You might have to pay an insane amount of money, but you can get a rented house if you want one. And we've got to be careful about uh, swapping that for a problem where it becomes more affordable, but you can't get one. Uh, and that's sort of where we were in the 70s. The other problem is uh, quality. And, you know, the quality of the private renter stock was pretty atrocious because landlords didn't bother investing in properties, mm -hmm. uh, which meant some of them were, 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 were atrocious places to live. Uh, and, and that is is a difficult problem that you can get if you have blanket rent controls. Uh, as Rachel sort of said, I think there's a much stronger case for looking at in tenancy rent controls because it's when you've got when you when tenants are in that's their home and then landlords try and hike rents at well beyond the market rate uh, that is trying to exploit their power in the situation to raise rents. Uh, that's more of an issue, and that's not sort of um, uh, that. That's a, an easier issue for rent controls to 
uh, to tackle. So I, so I think um, for my money, it would be better for regulations to focus on quality and making sure that houses are of decent quality. And we've seen all sorts of terrible stories in the social rental sector as well recently, obviously, but for many years in the private rental sector too, about poor quality housing and a bad service that landlords provide to tenants. And I think that should be the focus of regulation. And then when it comes to affordability, it's more for that's more for the government to step in and, and, and subsidise uh, lower income people to be able to make sure they can afford it. Um, Ian, you've, you've spoken in the past a lot about um, how supply and, in, and boosting housing supply won't suddenly solve all, all of the problems of the housing crisis. Um, we've had quite a few questions about empty homes and, and areas that have particularly large concentrations of, of empty homes. Um, are, are there are there things other things that the government could be doing to increase the efficiency of the use of the existing housing stock that we have? Um, you know, in in time, and they they are sort of talking about uh, you know we we have higher council tax on empty properties and and things like that. Uh, you know, are are there policy levers that you think should be being used to? In increase I suppose it's not just a question of number of properties but also number of bedrooms we we have enough bedrooms in this country for everyone um Ian could, could you talk a little bit about that and and you know are, are there things that the government could do on on empty homes yeah I mean I think one observation about the empty homes issue is that lots of those empty homes are in places where uh there aren't huge concentrations of population often they're somewhat peripheral areas and that kind of thing so it's not necessarily a simple um a, a simple read across to say well that 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 means there's uh there's there's plenty but i think you know if we look at um uh all regions of the country there has been a sort of uh, a much faster rate of housing units supplied than the number of households that are formed uh, which uh, tends to imply that, that, that that's not really the issue. There's probably things that you can do at the margin to sort of incentivize more efficient use of households and some of the things you've mentioned. Although, of course, if you are building houses at faster rate than households are forming, then by definition, you are going to get some empty houses. And that's what we've kind of got. Um, I, I think the other thing to bear in mind with all this is that more housing supply is always going to be a helpful thing to bear down on the, the price of market rents. But we just have to bear in mind the scale of these levers. Um, you know, it, it, some, somebody once said that economics is about working out what are big numbers and what are small numbers. And this is where I would say the economics tells us that the supply solution or policies to sort of tax unused bedrooms or whatever it might be, these are relatively small levers. You could do an awful lot and get a small amount of supply that would have a relatively marginal impact on rents um, that would probably not even be measurable in the national statistics. Uh, meanwhile, if you freeze local housing allowance in a year when rents are going up by 25%, uh, then that has a massive impact instantaneously on the affordability of housing. So we just have to keep in mind what kind of levers are really likely to shift the dial on affordability and which are relatively marginal. And I think the point is that any of the supply type stories we might want to tell are relatively marginal, really. Um, we've got one question which I think is a really, this, this one's, I, I find very interesting economically. Um, Charlie Berry asks, uh, does when when it comes to high private sector sector rents, how does that um, dampen labor flexibility? You know, is this locking people on lower incomes out of the ability to move to cities and take advantage of of labor markets? And I think that really ties into all of the problems that um, you know the Chancellor is incredibly concerned about. Uh, our, our labour shortage and the fact that people can't move into, uh, aren't aren't stepping up to fill these huge gaps that we have in our workforce and in turn what that means for, for inflation. And Rachel, could, could you maybe talk about, I mean, what, what are your thoughts on the extent to which our, our rental market is really holding back our labour market? Yeah, no, I, I think it's that's very much true. Um, I think I think it's really interesting when we're looking at our labour market sort of um, participation problem at the moment, um, and what sort of our JRF analysis shows is that um, the majority of that problem 
um, could like where, where we should be sort of looking for the solution to that problem is actually working age households um, who um, are in ill health um, and who um, just who need additional sort of support to get in, into the labour market, um, different kind of, you know, working conditions and, um, and, and so on. But if you think about it as well, it's also to do with like where like where a lot of those people might be living as well. So like if you are in the private rented sector, but you're struck with very high rents, you're very worried about whether or not you can find a new place to live that you can actually afford and would meet your needs. Um, particularly if you've got disabled family members, it is not easy to, 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 to move, uh, relocate, um, find, find housing that actually works for you. So I think that's a massive thing. Um, but also, I mean, when you, when you look at particularly for lower income households, um, options for, for living in cities like London or, or other cities where we are seeing massive rent rises at the moment, or even in areas where there's just a massive sort of shortage of private rental accommodation um, because of short term lets um, and so on. That, that's a massive thing. It's, uh, yeah, um, I don't sort of think that can be understated um, how much that is influencing people's decisions at the moment when housing takes up such a big part of your income. Um, one, I, um, maybe we've got time for one or two more questions. And I, I just wanted to ask um, how these issues flow into house prices as well. I think, I think there's generally a perceived wisdom. We obviously have seen this huge expansion of, of the buy to let market over the last 20, 20 or so years since, since we got the advent of buy to let mortgages in, in the 90s. And, and I think, you know, everyone does understand that, you know, that shift to uh, having properties as investments has, has flowed into house price increases. But I think the perceived wisdom has always been that, um, you know, landlords came in and they bought homes that would have been purchased by first time buyers. And actually what really stood out to me from the report is um, actually the scale at which they purchased homes that had previously been social rented properties and in a way I feel that's almost worse for the market you know it's not taking it's it's not that allocation of properties that would have been for first-time buyers but for people who were much lower income um you know I'm, I'm very interested to hear your thoughts on on that dynamic and and that kind of uh demographic shift is, is probably the wrong term, but, but the, the kind of move in ownership models in the housing market and how these rental sector dynamics have flowed into, into house prices. Yeah, so I think the I think it's I think you're right to say that a lot of the properties that gone into the PRS are uh, many of them are ex uh, social housing and therefore would typically have been catering for people at the lower end of the income distribution. But it's also true that at the other end, we've seen this collapse in home ownership, largely, uh, in, in my view, because of changes to how mortgage lending has operated, particularly since the financial crisis. Um, and those things have meant that there's at the other end, there's a group of people who would be first time buyers who, who no longer are. And so really, if we're to uh, we could tackle both of those things by providing more social housing and doing things to get more people to be able to buy their own to buy their own houses. Um, so I think so. Uh, so I think that is um, uh, that's one part of the story. I mean, in terms of properties as investments, I mean, I think it's it's probably true that though that the kind of financial deregulation around right to let mortgages and all that kind of stuff. Um, has probably uh, helped to uh, put the put the sort of boosters under house prices, um, but I think you know I, I'm always a bit wary of this idea that oh we, we we've decided to see housing as a financial investment rather than a um, that that a home. I mean really it's because it's a home that it's a financial investment, and so I don't see the two as unrelated. You know ultimately it provides a stream of rent, and at the moment it provides a. Uh, a growing stream of rent and uh, you know any asset that provides that kind of uh, uh, return is going to um, attract in, attract investment whether it's by owner occupiers who want to buy a house so they avoid having to pay rent themselves or whether it's by uh, private investors and I don't think that's the primary reason why um, uh, why we have an affordability problem in terms of high rents I think it's more the other way around that um, uh, that uh, that that people have uh, bought because 
uh, sorry, investors have bought because first time buyers can't basically. Uh, and so we need to tackle that um, uh, in order to sort of improve uh, the, the sort of level of home ownership, I think. Um, thank you. I'm, I'm conscious that we are uh, now just uh, just coming up to to our 11 o'clock cutoff. Um, Rachel, would you like to finish finally just just on a comment on how how much more you think the government needs to be prioritizing uh, housing and, and these issues that we've talked about today? Yeah, um, I mean, I, I was pretty devastated, to be honest, to see that there was absolutely nothing in the budget the week before last for housing. I think, you know, your home is your foundation in life. I think w without it um, and without it, you how are you meant to focus on everything else happening? And I think the very fact that the proportion of income that, that rents are taking up at the moment, the amount of anxiety and stress um, that insecure housing is causing so many families, our rates of temporary accommodation, the quality of our homes, um, and just in general how much we are having to pay for very poor quality housing through rent, um, while there are very limited options of getting on the housing ladder, um, and while no social housing effectively is being you know, built at the moment, um, is a real sort of indictment um, on, the, on the current um, on the current strategy of the government. So I think I, I, I want to see so much more ambition to make sure that we can change the way that our housing market is structured. We ultimately actually need to reduce the number um, or the proportion um, of, the, of the private rented sector across the country, because it's simply not working for too many households on low incomes with disabled family members, those who are entering retirement and those with children. It's not the right place for those kinds of households to be living in. We need more social housing to answer that and a lot more um, avenues for people to access home ownership so that we're changing the distribution of ownership and wealth across the country, that people are paying less of their disposable, less of their income on rents. Um, and, you know, they can put that more towards uh, leading, you know, more fulfilling lives in other ways through being able to actually afford things like, you know, uh, like to be able to afford the essentials, I guess. So I want to see a, a lot more coming from government in terms of building more homes, making rents more affordable, um, and in general, addressing the housing market downturn that is coming. Um, thank you so much, Rochelle, and, and thank you, Ian, and thank you to our audience for, for joining us today. Uh, a really good discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you.